Welcome back to our series on electron configuration. The next type of electron configuration that we're going to talk about is orbital notation. Okay, um, Orbital notation gives all the same information as electron configuration does, except it uh, accentuates how many electrons go in an orbital within an energy level for a specific element. Okay, here's how it works. An upward arrow indicates a clockwise spinning electron that has a plus one half uh, quantum spin number. Okay, and then a downward arrow indicates a counterclockwise spinning electron. Not all orbitals will have the maximum number of electrons in them, and we will follow the electron ascension uh, when filling our orbitals. Okay, there are two ways to express orbital notation. Um, the first way is with blanks using energy uh, hierarchy, I guess you could say, and the next one is called the box method, and it's more horizontal. This one's like vertical, this one's horizontal. So uh, let me show you what I mean. Okay, so here we have um, increasing energy, so we have uh, increasing energy levels, all right? And we have begun to fill these levels with the electrons, so we've got the 1s orbital filled with its two electrons. This one's clockwise, counterclockwise. The 2s orbital is filled, and then the p orbital here, or the p sublevel that has three orbitals in it, only has one electron. So that goes in the first p orbital, and since there's only one electron there, it's got a clockwise spin. Okay, so this is kind of like the vertical method. Here's the horizontal method or the box method. Uh, same thing, we've got the 1s filled, we've got the 2s filled, and then we've got the 2p here with only one electron in the very first one. And so this one would be our 2px, 2py, and 2pz. It is perfectly fine for you to kind of bracket these and just call it 2p instead of doing 2px, 2py, 2pz every single time we have a p orbital. All right, so what element are we talking about here where we've got uh, only one electron in the 2p orbital? Okay, so we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. We must be talking about boron. So we will fill that in down here. Boron, okay? Let's see if we can do some more. Okay, this same chart is in your notes. Um, we've already done the electron configurations. Let's see if we can do the orbital notations throughout. As we're starting out learning orbital notation, it's much easier if you already have the electron configurations done before starting in on the orbital notation. So here we have a 1s, a 2s, and a 2p orbital that we need to have lines for. Remember, um, the P sublevel has three orbitals, so it'll need three lines. So here's going to be our 1s, our 2s, and here is our 2p. All right, so 1s, 2s, and then, like I said, it's perfectly fine to bracket and call that 2p. All right, so we have two electrons in the 1s orbital. We have two electrons in the 2s orbital, and we have two electrons in the 2p orbital. So does it look like this? Is that right? No, that's not right. That is breaking Hund's rule. Remember, we said for Hund's rule, each one of the orbitals gets an electron before any of them get to have a second electron. So we need one electron here and one electron here. They're both up arrows because they're the only electron in that orbital so far, and therefore they're going to be clockwise spinning electrons. Okay, so that's carbon. Um, see if you can figure out what nitrogen and oxygen look like, and we'll come back in just a second and see how you did. Okay, so here's what we've come up with for nitrogen and oxygen. We've got 1s2, 2s2, 
two p three electrons each of them gets one before any of them gets seconds okay for oxygen one s two two s two two p has to have four electrons in it each of them gets a clockwise spinning and then we come back and give the counterclockwise to the two p x orbital here okay so here's some more practice these are out of your notes and I want you to see if you can do them without me, okay? So um, we've got calcium, we've got silver, and we've got phosphorus. This one's going to kind of be a long one because silver is in transition, so that's down in the D block. Um, but these shouldn't be too terrible, okay? Remember, it's easier if you do the electron configuration first and then uh, do your orbital notation, okay? Uh, take a second, see what you come up with. Okay, so here's what I came up with for you on the orbital notation. I've given the electron configurations in green, and then the orbital notations are obviously here in black and blue. So calcium ends in 4s2, so we fill up all of the orbitals, and then um, the 4s1 has two electrons, so it's got both clockwise and counterclockwise. Silver. Uh, goes all the way to 4d9 so we're going to fill up all of the orbitals until we get to 4d and then you go one up two up three up four up five up and then we come back six down seven down eight down nine down which leaves this one with only one electron in it and then phosphorus ends in 3p3, so we fill up all of these um, with their electrons. And then the 3p orbital, each orbital has got one electron in it, so that it's got its three total. Okay? Okay, the last type of configuration that we're going to talk about is called noble gas notation or core notation. This is kind of um, a shortcut method on electron configuration, because as we've seen, they can get really, really long. So this core notation kind of shortens it up for us, and here's how it works. You find the element on the periodic table that you're trying to do the um, electron configuration for. Then you're going to move up one row above that element and all the way over to the noble gases. You're going to write the atomic symbol for that noble gas in brackets. And then you just do the rest of the electron configuration. So here's um, an example down here. Boron normally has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. But if you look at the um, noble gas in the row above boron, you'll see that it's helium. So we put helium in brackets. Helium has an electron configuration of 1s2. So what's really happening here is that the configuration for the noble gas is taking the place of the configuration right here at the beginning. And then you just finish up the rest of the configuration for the element that you're talking about. So let's do an example. Okay. So we're trying to do the core notation for calcium, all right? Well, let's write the electron configuration for calcium first. You do not always have to do this. I'm just doing it here to um, draw your attention to, to some things. Okay, so that's the electron configuration. Now we need to go find the noble gas in the row above calcium. Okay, so here's calcium. We move up one row to the third row, go all the way over, and argon is the noble gas in the row above calcium. Okay, so what we're going to do is put argon in brackets, and then we complete the rest of the configuration, which was the 4s2. Okay, so that means that this is the core notation for calcium. See how much simpler that is? We let argon take the place of all of this stuff right here because this uh, is the configuration for argon. If you were to write down the electron configuration for argon, it would be 
1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So we just let it take the place of all that, and then we finish up with our 4s2 for calcium. Okay? So I want you to see if you can do silver and phosphorus. You do not need to write out the electron configuration. You can just write the core notation. Okay, so here are the core notations or noble gas notations for silver and phosphorus. We have krypton in brackets and then 5s2, 49. And then for phosphorus, we have neon in brackets, 3s2, 3p3. So hopefully you came up with both of those. All right, um, that takes care of all of our uh, different types of electron configurations. I hope that you understand it more now than you did before. Thank you so much for learning with me, and I will see you next time.